Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 518, the Monday morning edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. Je suis Gavin Ashenden, and it's the 8 juillet 2019. Okay, welcome to another program. Before we get started and break into the news, we want to let you guys have an opportunity to be part of the program. And you do that by sharing this episode with all your friends, former friends probably, people you used to like. Just set, you know, click on the link, send it to them. They would love to watch this program as much as you do. Please comment on YouTube. We got lots of wonderful comments and updates uh, from uh, our last episode. You saw the... Uh, interview I did which with Archbishop Foley. That was a lot of fun. And if you can and have not yet subscribed, please subscribe to the episode, uh, to the YouTube channel, and uh, you'll get updates as we publish more content. Gentlemen, well, two of us had a couple days off last week because we're colonialists and we are terrorists and we left England uh, over tea a long time ago. One of us is in France. He also left England. <laughs> So, <laughs> what are you doing over in France, Gavin? Well, I've been at the monastery in Tese, an ecumenical monastery, but I've also been talking to a, 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 an extraordinarily gifted theologian about the phenomenon of people receiving locutions from Jesus. So, although most of our viewers are going to be familiar with the charismatic uh, uh, gifts of prophecy within uh, Protestantism, uh, within Catholicism, there have been... Uh, an unending series of people getting messages from Jesus uh, about the times we live in. And the interesting thing is, uh, without these people coordinating with each other or knowing about each other, they say some very similar things. And in Cluny, right next to this monastery, is one of Europe's greatest authorities. He said one of his gifts is he can translate directly from Portuguese to Polish, which apparently helps in this process. So I had an extremely interesting meeting with him, and I also got to spend uh, seven days saying my prayers in this uh, this very powerful community, which I happen to think has lost its way, but that's why I was talking to the theologian I was talking to. George, you've uh, sent off your family to be in uh, Earthquakeville. Yes, the wives and uh, my daughter has uh, moved into a new home in Sherman Oaks, California, which I am reliably informed was where the Brady Bunch was filmed. So that's this right. is a very nice suburb of Los Angeles. Susan, my wife, is out there helping set up house. And they, Susan and Laura, my daughter, experienced the first earthquake. They had the two earthquakes Thursday. Uh, I think it was uh, Thursday and Saturday. Uh, the house shook and things fell off the counters. And it was quite exciting for them because they'd never been in one before. But the neighbors were terrified of, of gas mains bursting and fire. And, oh, it was quite exciting. Uh, oh, yeah. They for us tourists, there's nothing more fun than an earthquake because we can leave. You know, it's kind of, it, it's one of those strange things. Once you live there, they, they live under that anxiety that there's always the big one. When's it coming? When's it coming? It's been forecasted now for 100 years. Now, we, we could do small talk all day long because we want to avoid talking about what we're going to talk about. In fact, there's a point in the program we're going to ask our more sensitive viewers, especially younger viewers, just to click us off for a minute or to fast forward us for about a minute because uh, uh, it's just stuff you don't want to hear about. Oh, yes, we're going to talk about the Fletcher situation in England. Uh, I also want to talk with these gentlemen I have on the program, George and Gavin, about spiritual abuse versus sexual abuse um, amongst some of our topics. And I think, Gavin, you wrote an article on it, so let, let's talk about that first. You say there's really no such thing as spiritual abuse. My response is, have you not met Catherine Jefford Shorey? And so l let's talk about the, di the difference between sexual abuse and spiritual abuse. Well, I, I began this partly because um, Andy Lyons wrote his very moving uh, document about discovering that his relationship with Jonathan Fletcher had been one in which he had been victimized and, and wounded. Uh, and, and how long it had taken him to realize that. But he, he did it in the context of spiritual abuse. The, the reason the alarm bells go off for me is because um, there was a vicar about a year and a half ago in England 
who was given a lodging in a family. I think he'd had a nervous breakdown and was taken in. And in the family, there was a, a son uh, in his late teens, and the vicar did what any vicar should do, which is to pray with, with the people he was with. But because there were ethical implications, I think the son, the son had uh, gender identities, issues. Uh, the fact that the vicar prayed with him was deemed to be a matter of spiritual abuse. Now the problem is, if that's, if that's true, that means that, that any form of prayer in any circumstances could be deemed spiritual abuse by somebody who didn't like it. So as soon as you introduce this category, you then have a judgment to make about, well, anything you do in terms of prayer becomes potentially spiritually abusive. I think this is to give, I think this is a mistaken category for a start, and it sets a very dangerous precedent. So it, it, it's wrong and it's dangerous. What, what should we be talking about instead? We should be talking about abuse in a certain context. So, for example, there's abusive behavior within the family, and you'd say, well, this is sexual abuse in an incestuous context. Uh, you, we'd be talking about what Jonathan Fletcher did, and the answer is it's sadomasochistic abuse in an ecclesial or a spiritual context. It's not ecclesiastical abuse or spiritual abuse. It's, it's the abuse that it is. Now, the, the context, of course, if you do it that way around, you get to ask some more sensible questions about what the expectations of that context are in terms of how dangerous or how unwelcome or how improper or unwise at the other end of the scale activity is. But I think the term spiritual abuse uh, is, is a mistaken category and it, it, it offers to people who want to close Christianity down much too, uh, much too great an, an instrument to do it with. Well, uh, yeah, if you're not going to bake a cake for a gay wedding, that's spiritual abuse. If you're gonna if you're gonna be a nurse at a hospital and offer prayers for a, a patient, that would be spiritual abuse, according that's to the a, world. That, that, that's an excellent example because yeah. it, it could it, you would call it spiritual abuse, but is it medical abuse? Mm -hmm. Given that there's a great there are a number of studies, uh, including we take into account placebo placebo effects, but there are a number of studies in the last twenty years in the area of psychology, where actually using spirituality well is medically productive. So. It would not be medical abuse, but you could certainly make it out to be spiritual abuse. And that's, that's a, it's a very good example, Kevin, of why I want to make that distinction. Well, can it, Gavin, let me ask a question. Can abuse take place when authority is not present? Sounds like you can answer the question for me, George. Go ahead. <laughs> well, um, every so often, the church, uh, bishops, uh, the Church of England, the Episcopal Church and whatnot, will uh, uh, release these grand statements on political or social or ethical matters. And I take absolutely no mind, uh, because I, they may have legal and canonical authority, but, but uh, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury has very little spiritual authority. He's not somebody whom I look to uh, as I've gotten to know him over the years, as somebody who has a direct line with God. In fact, I sometimes think the, direct, the wires are going in another place. If that, if you do not grant somebody in your own life, or in your own mind, that spiritual authority, can they still abuse you spiritually? Or can they just abuse you legally or canonically? At, or they can wreck your career or your life or your, send you to prison and all this and that. But well, that, does the spirit have anything to do with <clears throat> where does spiritual authority lie? Well, that, that's one of the reasons why I wrote an article which Cranmer published, because I wanted to make a link between uh, the fact that you could have a context where there is some form of sexual abuse. But it's almost always linked, uh, in ecclesiastical terms, to the abuse of power. And especially in the Church of England, where patronage is so invasive everywhere, although I expect it is in most churches, to the, to the, to the abuse of power and patronage. Um, I resist the term spiritual abuse. I think, I think spiritual is the word we, we keep for context. It describes the context. The abuse is more likely to be psychological abuse or the abuse of power or sexual abuse. Uh, but but I, I think you know, we, just, we, we, we need a, the adjective describes the kind of abuse and spiritual seems to me belongs best describing the context the abuse takes place in. All right. Well, I want to transition at this point because we're going to make very clear uh, in in this that some things that Mr. Fletcher did were not 
spiritual abuse, but of a sexual nature. Do you guys want to make the transition now? Yeah, but before we do that, Kevin, the, the point we're going to make, which is my point exactly, uh, is that it was sexual abuse, but with spiritual consequences. Uh, right. And the, spirit, and the reason why we're involved at all is because the consequences were, well, there would have been a number, but they would have included psychological, marital, existential, mm -hmm. but they include spiritual as well. So George, the, uh, he sent his family off to California, and he's been the investigative reporter for Anglican Inc. this whole weekend. He's had nothing better to do than go back and forth with all these emails, collecting all the information, and he's talked to witnesses, he's talked to victims, he's uh, tried to reach Jonathan Fletcher himself. With, uh, and I had five sermons and a class. And five sermons, yeah. And he's been been a, a priest as well, doing all, all those duties. He's, he's And so we've been getting, Gavin and I have been getting a little uh, WhatsApp notices from uh, George all week. What do you think of this? Should I do this? Well, it, yeah, it was a, a great time because there's a lot to flesh out here. What George is going to describe over the next minute, and I'm only giving him a minute because I don't want you guys to turn off the podcast for two minutes. I need you to... Uh, uh, I, mean, I, I think, Kevin, I think we need, before we go into details, to lay yeah. the groundwork. Because yeah, lay, lay the groundwork. And then, it's not sufficient to tell the story. And then tell, tell them when you're going to let them back in into the podcast. Okay. Well, as we've uh, discussed in prior episodes, uh, we've been looking into the... Uh, Ewan, John Smythe, now Jonathan Fletcher, abuse uh, culture in the conservative evangelical circles within the Church of England. Um, the two weeks ago, I think it was, or a week and a half ago, the Evangelical Mi Ministry Assembly, uh, Vaughn Roberts, uh, gave a presentation where they basically outed uh, Jonathan Fletcher, who's in his late 70s, was... Uh, Minister of the Propriety Chapel uh, Manual in Wimbledon, in England, one of the major, major figures uh, within the evangelical world of the Church of England. Now, what does that mean exactly, a major figure within the Church of England? This is someone at the very apex of the power structure, who is a member of all the appointments committees, who is a member of all the right clubs, who is a member of all the right societies, who is a speaker at all the conferences, who is a revered elder. The man's not a bishop, but that doesn't matter in conservative evangelical circles. This is the spider at the middle of the web. And this man was accused of spiritual abuse. And this was laid out at the EMA assembly at, at uh, Westminster Chapel in London, beginning of July, end of June. Andy Lyons, the bishop of the Anglican mission in England, uh, released a statement where he did not name Fletcher, but he said that he had been subjected to spiritual abuse by his mentor. Lines uh, has known uh, Fletcher for almost all of his life, from his teens to the present, and it's uh, and it was quite clear that this is who he was speaking about, and it's been confirmed ten different ways that he's talking about Fletcher. So we've been investigating. And at this point, I have spoken with victims. Uh, and I know that one, two, three of the major newspapers in England have spoken to victims. I know one of the news uh, programs have, is investigating. This story is going to come out. I'm at the point where the people with whom I have spoken are debating whether or not I'm allowed to go forward with their story. Uh, so... What friends, what I'm telling you is not salacious gossip. It is the result of my investigations. And I have also passed what I've known on to the safeguarding officer of the Diocese of Southwark. Uh, because I'm a reporter and I'm a priest and I have an obligation to be faithful to both of those calls. The allegations of at, at the EMA assembly, Vaughn Roberts said laid out uh, the spiritual abuse committed by Jonathan Fletcher, where he would psychologically and spiritually manipulate young men and uh, to their disadvantage. Uh, there was also a sexual con there was also a sexual component to this, um, where Fletcher would groom young men whom he met in their teens and in their and no accusation has come forward that anything took place with a minor. 
but there are many accusations that have come forth that Fletcher committed acts of gross indecency with or on uh, young men. The uh, young men are to, who are now in their 40s and 50s, some of them, uh, are basically debating in their minds, do we come forward? Uh, I'll give you an example uh, that I hope that uh, uh, I'm not saying is in the person who I'm talking about, but I know that this story is there. Uh, while punting. Uh, uh, this is where we want, if you have reason you don't want to listen to a uh, an example of sexual abuse, turn off for a minute or two, or fast forward. While punting uh, near Grantchester, which Gavin tells me is a place where you punt uh, outside yeah. of Cambridge. Uh, Fletcher, who was in his 40s at the time, and a young man uh, stopped by the bank side and they took off their clothing and went swimming. Now, in Vaughn Roberts' account at the EMA, he said that nude mutual massages were given to, by Fletcher to young men, and young men gave Fletcher nude massages. And uh, there was also some spanking and horseplay. And Fletcher has defended himself in, in the Church Times by saying the... Uh, this was mutual. It was just horseplay, and uh, it's good old public school, you know, rugger, uh, military barracks, uh, male frivolity. Well, they they after swimming nude in the in the the river, they drying themselves off, and Fletcher introduced the top. And they began spiritually counseling. Fletcher spiritually counseling the young man, as was their the, the focus of their relationship. And the topic turned to masturbation. And he was asked, the young man was asked, did he masturbate? The man conceded he did. And Fletcher asked him to masturbate in front of him. And for me, this is the telling point. The young man was not able to manage an erection uh, in the request for him to masturbate in front of Fletcher. So Fletcher masturbated in front of the young man. This uh, is an example. This is called gross indecency. Though this was of someone of legal age, Fletcher holds a license from the Church of England at the time. As a priest, he was in his place of spiritual authority. He's talking about the man's soul, and he is manipulating him. This is how is spiritual abuse is defined. But this is also what Peter Ball did. Peter Ball would offer spiritual counsel, and uh, Gavin can speak to this more uh, clearly, uh, but he would call it asceticism, rather than muscular Christianity. Lad, you know, the lads and cold showers and push-ups and nude bathing, for, for Peter Ball, it was uh, a different form of asceticism, but it's the same genre. And for Fletcher, what this was, was not only the abuse of a young man by abusing his office as a, a priest and a public office holding a license from the Diocese of Southwark, this is also a form of uh, Christian heterodoxy, that he's teaching false Christian doctrine besides being a pervert. In other words, that to be repentance involves corporal punishment. God really doesn't love you unless you're beaten, unless you're humiliated, unless there's sadism involved. And this is one of the central figures of the conservative evangelical movement in the Church of England. and. Why people are protecting this man, I have no clue. But again, let me just say that Fletcher, who attempted to contact, for, uh, has, Fletcher has declined to comment. Fletcher's not on email. He was on vacation. I contacted him through a mutual, mutual acquaintance. Mutual acquaintance, uh, you know, we were going to talk, and then Fletcher said, no, I don't want to talk. Uh, and he asked me to ask Bishop Rod Thomas to be his spokesman. When I shared this with Bishop Thomas, Bishop Thomas was a little incredulous uh, that he was being thrown to the press as the sacrificial victim for Fletcher's crimes. But there you have it. Well, now, you, there's imagery there of the sadomasochism. One of the first you know, movies I ever saw as a young college boy was Monte Python's The Holy Grail. And one of the opening scenes is... Uh, the monks walking through uh, the alleyways, flagellating themselves with boards. And uh, I, is this just something that's very 
European that I don't understand? Is this some teaching concept of uh, early Christianity that yeah, but maybe it's just that we're American prudes grown up in in, in, in the culture of uh, wholesomeness and apple pie and well, the, uh, I, I, and you know, I want to. I want to ask Gavin, you know, what am I missing here with my understanding of penal substitution? Well, if, we, if we go back to the, the, the flagellating monks of the Holy Grail, um, it one, to my mind, the confusion between asceticism and sadomasochism uh, is an easier one to make in, in Catholic spirituality because, because there at least the flesh is seen as something you have to struggle with, in, with particularly in the context of chastity. It's a problem uh, and by inflicting pain on it, you may be able to divert its attention from desire. So there's a, there's a, a sense in which you're struggling with something which has profound appetites. Um, I suppose it's a bit, it's a bit like um, uh, if, if you bang your thumb with a hammer, then stamping on, with your, on your foot may distract attention from the pain in your hand. But the problem I have with the evangelical version of it is that this is the group who were most drawn to penal substitution as uh, as a theory of the atonement. Now, I, I'm, I'm aware that we have at least seven theories of the atonement, and they speak to one another, and they, they have a uh, they, they provide us with a spectrum of understanding that we because one of them doesn't work by itself. I think penal substitution says something very powerful. It's therefore a terrible tragedy, and perhaps it's even a satanic perversion of it, that the punishment borne by Christ on the cross for our sins is not enough for, um, for the Christians in the context we're talking about, but further punishment has to be inflicted. I, I suspect it's probably a mishandling of the Catholic theology of asceticism um, without understanding it properly. But it's paradoxical that whereas a proper understanding of penal atonement, uh, penal substitution, means that Jesus takes the punishment, and in that sense, we don't have to. To overlay that with sadomasochistic rituals of some kind is is, is a very sad and um, improper thing to do. Part of the 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 consequences of this. Um, last last episode, we spoke of a man who's a peer uh, of ours in age, who was a victim of uh, Jonathan Smythe and who later as an older teen became a co-conspirator with Jonathan Smythe. He carried on the beatings. He went from an abuse, uh, abuse uh, uh, from being abused to being an abuser. Um, let's put the little American angle in this. One of the loudest proponents, uh, opponents of penal substitutionary atonement is Bishop Jack Spong. Bishop Jack Spong is called this divine child abuse. And one of his, if you will, routines or shticks is that he is rebelling against his fundamentalist, rigid Christian upbringing and bringing the Christian faith into a new light. And this is the same path where you get some people who respond to this sort of upbringing by becoming abusers. I'm not saying Spong was abused, but then you get some people who, who go so far as to throw the whole thing out that anything anything related in any way to the idea that christ died for our sins uh is abuse is child abuse so in other words you're you're not only raising up a new generation who are uh being perverted from the course of the true faith you're also driving away people from the faith one of the great sources of new members of my Episcopal Church are ex-Catholics who uh, are so, who either have had such miserable experiences with the Catholic Church in the United States, um, or just are sick of the perpetual cover-up. And there are real consequences for protecting each other's backsides in this, and that is you're destroying the Church. I, I think one of the things that I've been most concerned about is this transition from victim to condoning, condoning agent. Um, we move quite quickly from uh, sexual abuse through to the abuse of power and patronage. And there are going to be a number of people in Jonathan Fletcher's circle. As George at the beginning of the program said, uh, sit, ha, occupy positions that were obtained to them by commit, for them by committees in which Fletcher sat. 
I think the pro problem we have is we, 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 that the church needs people who were part of Fletcher's circle to, to come clean in terms of what they understood what was going on and what they did or didn't do about it. Um, I, I feel very sorry for, for Andy Lyons discovering a man who plays such an important part as a father figure in his life should have been so dangerous. But it's, but it's quite problematic to be told that Andy only realised the level of, uh, I'm sorry, a personal, but, this, but, but Andy Lyons has put this in the public space himself. It's quite problematic that, that his realisation should only have come in the last 24 months because what Fletcher was doing, George has only given one example, but there are four or five people who are talking to a group of priests. Um, if you put these five stories together, it's really quite difficult to think that nobody else in his immediate circle had any inkling of this sexual abuse in a spiritual context. And that's the point at which uh, victims become condoners or corroborators. No, not corroborators, just condoners. Let me take it back to the Catholic angle. People may know the name of Cardinal Kevin Farrell, who was an American uh, Roman Catholic priest uh, who's now at the Vatican. He's one of the senior major figures in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Curia. Uh, he lived with Cardinal McCarrick in Washington for a number of years. And he his response to the discoveries and the all the things that came out about Cardinal McCarrick but, but being a molester of seminarians and young men was, I knew nothing. I didn't know what was happening across the hallway. Nobody ever said anything to me. Now, there's no evidence to, dispro to disprove Car Kevin Farrell's, Cardinal Farrell's accusations. But we're in that same land of people who are in position and positions of authority are tainted uh, just by the association and by their blindness to what was going on. <sighs> and hindsight is always twenty twenty. You know, and it's, see, it's, it's a, this it, is this well, is also affecting. Now let let's move it from the individual to the corporate. This is also affecting the Gafcon movement. Gafcon selected Andy Lyons. There was no process by which names were submitted or people were elected or where the constituency uh, were, were uh, canvassed as to who should be their bishop. In a back room, Andy Lyons, a protege, Jonathan Fletcher, was chosen. For good or ill, that's how that came out. Um, and the, the facts are the diocese, is, you know, Jonathan Fletcher lost his permission to officiate in 2017 from the Diocese of Southern. 2018 in September, after Andy Lyons was, uh, was consecrated in the United States, uh, there was a commissioning service at Emmanuel Wimbledon in September of 2018. Robin Weeks, the, the minister at Emmanuel Wimbledon, preached at the service, and then there was a Q&A led by Jonathan Fletcher and Andy Lyons. And the question, and a question I've put to a number of people is, did you not know that Andy Lyons didn't have a permission to officiate? Well, not Andy Lyons, <laughs> Fletcher. You, you said Fletcher. I'm sorry, excuse me. Did you <laughs> not know <laughs> that Jonathan Fletcher did not have a permission to officiate? And one of the people who I put this question to is Bishop Rod Thomas, the Bishop of Maidstone. And he said, yes, I knew, but I, at the time, I did not know why, and Fletcher had told told him that he had voluntarily surrendered his PTO out of solidarity with Andy Lyons, because Andy Lyons had lost his PTO from the Church of England for starting up the AMIE. There's a big problem there. Fletcher lost his PTO in February of 2017. So he lied. And Lyons had his PTO was not removed in July of 2017. So Jonathan Fletcher, either through an act of the Holy Spirit, was so prescient that five months ahead of Andy Lyons losing his PTO, he surrendered his in solidarity with something that didn't happen, or he lied to Rod Thomas. Well, Rod Thomas confirmed that Andy, that uh, Fletcher was not being entirely straightforward. But nobody would ask the question. They just assumed that uh, this man who lied and, and held himself out as a person in good standing, not someone under a cloud for abuse. Who is a, uh, and so the whole start of the AMIE 
uh, was, if you will, tainted by the presence of an abuser on the stage. Some... It's, it, we see this in the, in the Catholic press where we'll have these uh, uh, meetings and you'll see Cardinal Roger Mahoney from Los Angeles who was disgraced over his handling of abuse. Or you saw Cardinal McCarrick before he was defrocked at these meetings acting as if there was nothing wrong even though uh, they had been suspended or had their licenses withdrawn or whatnot, the institution carried on and kept these men in prominence. And this is what's happened in the Fletcher case. And that, I think that's the big problem here is the diocese revoked his PTO and didn't tell anybody why. He, you know, is for all intents and purposes spiritually dangerous, not, you know, we're not going to use spiritual abuse, but... Uh, I think that's where this ball could have stopped. If they would have said, listen, he's under investigation for things he did that are outside the bounds of his clerical duties. You know? it, it, as much as it pains me to do this, Kevin, I, mean, I have to defend the Diocese of Soviet. I don't. When, you can. When, a, when an Episcopal priest gets, lose, gets canned, uh -huh. you, just, you just get a form letter saying this person... Uh, has lost, is no longer a priest of the Episcopal Church, and then it'll have a lot of saying, and this was due to either actions affecting moral character or not affecting moral character. You never get a detailed case by case unless you, you know, are buddies with the person, the inquisitor who did it. Okay. So, in other words, the very fact that Southwark did this, and this is a public act, it's not that like they did it and hit it in the filing cabinet. Rather, the onus is on the people in the evangelical world who chose to believe a convenient lie peddled by Fletcher rather than asking a question. And, and that's, where, that's where things become really quite serious, because only up to two weeks ago, the evangelical assembly was essentially trying to keep a lid on it by saying, let's not talk about it uh, and let's not deal with it in the open, whilst at the same time, uh, sending texts to some of the people they knew to have been victims, uh, saying, you know, are you all right? Do you want to talk about it? Which is a euphemism for shut up and only talk to us. Now, the, the problem I have with that is that um, if two weeks ago some of the victims were known to be victims to, and received that kind of pastoral care, the, a number of people need to be asked the question about Fletcher. What did you know? When did you know it? And what did or didn't you do about it? rather than simply to condone, to, to, to take responsibility for a culture of cover-up, which is what we have at the moment. And the fact is that if it's not done by them, it will be blown to pieces by the secular press, uh, and, and they'll wish they dealt with it themselves. All right, we've hit this for 30 minutes. I do want to follow and transition into a wonderful actor of the 50s, uh, Cornell Wilde. Uh, he recently sat down and penned an article for Anglican Inc., um, what do you think the impact? Well, George, give me a basics of how we got the article. I, I thought it was Farley Granger. Or yeah, something. Like that. Or, oh, um, oh. Yeah, there are people in England who are really upset about this. They don't want to come out and let people know who they are because it would be horrid. But they're putting pen to paper, and we're reading some interesting articles here. Tell me a little about the, about the Cornell Wild article. Uh, the Cornell Wilde article published from Anglican Inc., which has one, been one of the more popular ones. I'm glad we're not paying royalties to the estate of Cornell Wilde. <laughs> That's right. Um, detailed the, cult, the culture of conservative evangelicalism, of a small circle of, of the UN camps, of private of public schools, of universities, of theological colleges, of people knowing people and getting their jobs in the right churches and going through the right circles and everybody covering else, everybody, everybody protecting each other. It's a very detailed expose of the English class system at its worst at work. And it basically raises several points. First off, there is no evangelical outreach by this group to anybody but the upper middle classes. They don't exist. The oinks out there are not worth uh, bringing to Jesus Christ. Uh, just just the one, one very small um, exception. Um, uh, I served my curacy in the old Docklands of Bermondsey, and there, right next to the parish church, was the Cambridge University Mission. Some of these people 
who also went to St. Helens Bishopsgate and Victor Lucas, deliberately did put themselves in, in very deprived working class places. But, but George, let them be the exception to the truth of the general rule that otherwise you stated. So, with that, with that correction in mind, the the ethos that I took away from reading this is it reminded me of a, very much of the Kim Philby affair of a John Le Carré novel, of the knowledge that uh, that of uh, corruption and e and being in bed with the enemy. It's more important to keep that covered up and and keep the outward world uh, ignorant. Than it is in dealing with the evil itself. Um, one of the things in my 25 years now within the Anglican world is the observation that the only bastion of the British Empire left, it was the Church of England and the International Anglican Communion. And it still functions in a small way like that, where we have some Anglican primates overseas who are completely at one with the GAFCON movement in terms of its aims and goals and belief system, but because they think they need a connection to the government of a, of a power, they need to play nice with the Church of England. Now that's been receding every year, faster and faster and faster and faster. And part of the uh, mindset and the worldview of the uh, this inner circle is to maintain that control over power while everything else falls apart. One of the things I found fascinating is as I was doing research on the Fletcher affair, I, I talked to various people and Fletcher was a big deal in Sydney. He would visit Moore College and he was really tied into the, into the movers and shakers there. I talked to the Gospel Coalition in the United States and that's sort of the heavyweight uh, reform. Who's who? It's the who's, who's who. who. Yeah. And there was an Englishman on their staff who knew about Fletcher, but everybody else said, no, I don't know who you talk about. Fletcher has, has had no influence whatsoever on the American scene, but he's had a major influence in New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and places like that. In other words, trying to keep the lifelines of the old empire, the old privilege, the old elite, the old castes going. And what this is my interpretation of Cornell Wilde's article, but what it has done, it has destroyed... Uh, it, not destroyed, it has poisoned the witness of Jesus Christ to so much of the people of England who see it as another, as a vestige of a class system to which they will never gain access. The, the article has exposed the poisoning. The article didn't do the poisoning. And, yeah. and Gavin, I, I have four or five Facebook messages from conservatives in England, evangelicals in England. Not one of them denies the article. But they all want to know who wrote it. That's the curious. They, 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 they're not sitting there. That never happened. I don't know what he's talking about. That's you know. That, there's no denial. But and it wasn't me, of course. No, no. Well, and but also we've had uh, comments and emails and notes saying, you know, I know this is true, but I've never been part of this circle, and you know, my Christian faith and my circle is strong, but we're cognizant of the fact that we're not on the inside. George, so I this not exclude so that not all. Far from it, far from it. This is a very small group within the Christian world in England, but they're in that group that has the money and the buildings and the institutions on their side. George, I, I just want to say, I, I do know who wrote it. And I think part of the travesty of this is that somebody of the intellectual and spiritual caliber, as the author clearly is, that's self-evident, is unable to do it in his own name without a concern that the consequences would be unchristian, anti-Christian, and wholly destructive. The fact that it has to be done under a pseudonym or non de plume uh, is another element of proof of the rottenness, the rottenness of, of, of English tribalism and English class and culture. You know, it, it, we, we, we've constantly said in a struggle with the secular progressive culture, either you convert it or it converts you. But, but in a much more subtle way, the cultural caste system of the Church of England, of, of the cultural caste system of secular England, has converted some elements of evangelical Christianity. Well, again, time to repent and throw it off and start converting them to Jesus instead of the other way around. Okay, full stop. Guys, it's time to let George go to his staff meeting here. Uh, let Gavin 
do what you do in France. You're going to open some red wine and watch the Tour de France on TV whilst I have to get busy because I had four days off last week. You know, that's just part of being a cantankerous terrorist to the English. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm all, the always libelous George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashton. You've been listening to episode 518 of Anglican Unscripted on the 8th of July, 2019. Thank you for your patience. Remember to pray.